with major breakthroughs in technology, Starfleet Command would begin to reconstruct all of its fleet, creating entire new classes to supplant the Old Guard. And one of these classes, the Akyazi class, would make its own rather unusual mark on the Federation. Hello and welcome to another episode of Truth or Myth Beta Canon, a Star Trek web series that dives into the history of any given topic using Beta Canon sources and my own imagination to fill in the gaps. In today's episode, we're taking a look at the Akyazi class, as first seen in Star Trek fan fiction, to better understand its place in Star Trek history. This video is a bit different from my regular videos, in that this Starship class isn't really Beta Canon at all, appearing in fan fiction and other non-licensed sources. But because I love the design, I decided to research the class and came up with the story you're about to hear. But as always, because this is a fan fiction design, all information relayed should pretty much be taken with a grain of stardust and only considered a little bit of Star Trek fun. And so, with all that out of the way, let's begin. The past two decades had been a rough time for the United Federation of Planets. Having been devastated during the first Federation Klingon War, having a second Federation Klingon War narrowly avoided thanks to the Organian species stepping in, had rattled both Starfleet and the Federation public as a whole. Add to that the re-emergence of the Romulan Star Empire onto the galactic stage, and the Zenkethi, Gorn, and Tholians causing trouble throughout the Alpha and Beta Quadrants, and one can immediately understand Starfleet's push to improve its own fleet. As a direct result of this push, the Constitution class refit and the Miranda class would make their debut in the latter 2260s and early 2270s. Both would be huge successes with the Constitution class refit going into full and rushed production following the V'ger crisis. And with these successes, Starfleet wanted more designs to replace the already existing vessels, covering all possible Starship mission profiles. One of Starfleet's biggest concerns was the protection of its borders, outposts, and star bases close to hostile space. Up until the First Federation Klingon War, Starfleet had merely let bases defend themselves. Any starbase or outpost after all could simply call for a nearby starship to help should any trouble arise. But this line of thinking had resulted in the destruction or conquering of many bases by the Klingon Empire's forces. And with several bases along the neutral zone being destroyed during the Romulan re-emergence, Starfleet Command finally decided this was a problem that they needed to address. And so, while construction began on several new Constitution class refits at Utopia Planitia, Starfleet had its Starship designers create a class that could be permanently placed at Starfleet and Federation facilities throughout their space. This new class was to be much smaller than the Miranda and Constitution class refits. They would have no unnecessary facilities, no science labs, no recreational facilities such as bowling alleys or swimming pools. They would merely be designed for speed and defense. And by mid-2273, Starfleet's Admiralty would be presented with this new design. Impressed by the Starship class, Starfleet would then in turn take the design to the Federation Council for approval, and the Council would reject the project. Though the previous decades had been trying times for the Federation, things were really looking up for the organization. With the fear of the Organians keeping the Klingon Empire at bay, and several peace initiatives taking place with both the Klingon Empire and the Romulan Star Empire, the Federation Council felt that creating such a class was not only a waste of time and resources, but also quite provocative, going against the peace processes they had begun. Starfleet's Admiralty and the Federation Council not seeing eye to eye on various issues throughout their existence was nothing new. But Starfleet Command warned the Council of its short-sightedness, all to no avail. As a result, this class would be pushed aside, while all of Starfleet's resources 
would be poured in the other classes they had been developing, such as the Oberth class. Time is a patient adversary, looking for the right opportunity to remind everyone of past misdeeds. And in the mid-2280s, that's exactly what would happen. 2285 would begin to change the galactic stage once again. Several incidents would occur that would shake the Federation to its core. Kanunian Singh, a genetically engineered Superman from Earth's 20th century, would almost destroy the USS Enterprise using the Miranda-class USS Reliant, and this incident would result in the death of one of the Federation's most respected Starfleet officers, Captain Spock. The Genesis torpedo, a life-generating, potentially disastrous doomsday-type weapon, would be a hot-button issue throughout the Alpha and Beta quadrants. And with the disappearance of the Organians, for reasons at the time unknown, had the Federation Council quaking in their boots. With the destruction of the USS Enterprise bringing this fear to a head. Then, in 2286, a probe of unknown origin would set course for Earth, disabling starships and bases along its path. And Starfleet was ill-prepared to deal with the crisis, and Earth itself was almost lost in the process. And so, Starfleet decided to once again approach the Federation Council with its now updated design for a purely defensive Starship class. And this time, the Federation Council would give its full approval and support to the project. And thus, the Akyazi class would be born. Sitting at a length of 216.1 meters and a width of 120.2 meters, the Akyazi class would be designed to be operated by 84 officers and crew members. The Akyazi class would have a standard safe cruising speed of warp factor 8 and a maximum emergency speed of a theoretical Warp Factor 12. Partially designed for speed, this class would take advantage of all the latest developments in warp technology, making it one of the fastest classes in Starfleet at the time, able to maintain high warp for far longer than any other class. The class's warp drive also had special shielding to reduce the energy signature given off by the starship, making it far more difficult to detect the class at long range. The Akyazi class was also capable of atmospheric flight and planetary landing. Eight dual-phaser emitter banks would provide primary protection for this starship. Like the Constitution Refit and Miranda classes, primary phaser energy would be channeled directly through the warp drive system, providing a huge increase in phaser destructive power. However, unlike the aforementioned vessel classes, the Akyasi class would also have supercharged backup phaser batteries in case the warp drive was offline or warp power was unavailable. Three photon torpedo launchers, two forward and one aft, would round out the class's weaponry. Shielding for the class was also improved and could withstand a huge amount of damage given the class's size. An indent in the class's primary hull would also contain the class's improved deflector system. Because this starship class was designed for limited use, the Akyazi class starship would often be assigned to starbases and outposts, with its crews taking up residency on the bases themselves. Quarters aboard the starship were cramped barrack-style rooms that offered no luxuries whatsoever. In fact, only the ship's captain would have their own quarters. Even the 24th century Defiant class, a class believed to be slightly inspired by this design, seems spacious in comparison. This class also contained no shuttle bay, completely dependent on transporters and docking ports for offloading its crew. It did, however, contain two large cargo bays, which could be used to deliver emergency supplies to nearby colonies or converted to medical or habitat facilities to transport rescued persons. A full complement of escape pods provided emergency evacuation for the class. The USS Akyazi would be launched in late 2286 
and perform above and beyond expectations during its shakedown cruise. And the class would go into full production with the intent of at least one vessel of the class assigned to every base throughout the Federation. This did not end up happening, however. By the early 2290s, it was clear that although the Excelsior class had failed its transwarp experiment, the refit of the class to a more standard Starfleet spec was outshining all other classes in the fleet. And Starfleet also felt that the Excelsior class was the future of Starfleet going into the 24th century. And so production of the Akyazi class was scaled down. Because of the scaled down production of the class, constructed starships would be assigned to what was considered high risk areas, with the Akyazi class staying in service until the early 2320s, when continued starship developments made this aging class obsolete. Because of the Akyazi class's mission profile, this vessel class tends to be overlooked by most Starfleet officers and Federation citizens. Nevertheless, this class performed admirably during its run, defending the Federation from any threats it encountered. And this fact alone earned the Akyazi class its special place in Starfleet history. Thank you for watching today's episode of Truth or Myth Beta Canon. What do you think of the Akyazi class and the historical narrative that I've created here? Do you want to see more videos on fan design starship classes? Well, leave your comments in the section below. And don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel, hitting that little bell icon so you won't miss a single video we release. Want to help the channel defend the Federation from outside threats? Then consider becoming a channel patron. The link to our Patreon account is in the description below. Thanks again for watching, live long, and prosper.